Oftentimes, I get asked the question, how in the world did you ever get involved in biblical counseling? And I've got to answer that question very clearly. I came into it kicking and screaming. It's not something that I wanted to do at all. When I went to seminary, you've got to understand, I went to seminary to do one thing. I love preaching. And I still think to this day, that's my strong suit. Preaching's fun. Counseling is hard work. All right, no doubt about that. And when I went to seminary, all I did was take all kinds of exegetical, theological classes, preaching classes and stuff to learn how to preach. When I graduated from seminary, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to go out and preaching. So God actually, in his infinite wisdom, put me on the staff of a church. It was a larger church, and I became an associate pastor there. But the senior pastor there required everybody on the church staff to get biblical counseling training. That included all the secretaries and all the church staff. Everybody had to get it. Everybody had to be prepared with it. So when I heard that I had to do that and jump through those hoops, I really had a bad attitude about it. I thought, oh, I do not want to do this. What made matters worse was the place where we were supposed to get it was two and a half hour drive away and it started at 9 o'clock in the morning, and it went until 10 o'clock at night for 12 weeks every Monday, all right? Bad attitude, all right? Bad attitude. I remember the first day driving two and a half hours. I had to get up like at 4 o'clock in the morning, jump in a car, drive all the way over there, and I'm grumbling, complaining, sinning all over the freeway, all right? I didn't want to do it. I, I just didn't want to do it. I thought, what in the world? There's probably no one more dangerous on this planet than a guy that's just graduated from seminary because he thinks he's got the entire world all tied together. He thinks he knows that. And I was one of those. And I did not want to take this. Um, and I arrived, and I remember there was about 40, 50 people in the classroom there most of them are pastors and I sat in the back with the bible and notebook slumped down so I'm always curious at conferences who's sitting in the back I'm always curious about that so I'm all slumped down and thought oh my goodness here we go now I've got to endure this day and um, so the day went on the first three or four hours was just kind of lecturing on what biblical counseling was all about and then we were assigned to sit in and watch counseling so myself, another pastor was assigned to sit in with a counselor, and in this case, another pastor. In fact, he became a dear friend of mine. At that time, I didn't know who he was, but he became a dear friend. His name was Dr. Bill Good. Good. And Bill was a good friend of Bob Jones University and um, big supporter of uh, Bob Jones here. And, it, and so I was called upon. He's a very gracious man. And Bill said, okay, now uh, I've got counselees that are coming in from out of state. They've driven all the way from out of state. <clears throat> I don't know exactly why they're coming here. And he says, uh, I don't want you to say anything until I call on you, and then you can say something, but just observe. So I was more than willing to do that. I sat there with my Bible notebook, and I was just going to take notes and observe how he did, did things. Pretty soon, this couple arrived. And they came in, and it was an elderly couple, about 75, between 75, 80 years of age, very well-dressed. He was in a three-piece suit, and he had a tie on and cufflinks, and she had a beautiful dress on. And he, inter he came and uh, introduced them to us, and I could tell that they didn't want to look us in the eye too much. And they sat down across the table from Bill, and uh, Bill said, I know you've driven from out of state. I'm not sure exactly why you've come, but we're going to find that out. Let's pray first. And so he bowed his head and prayed. And after he was finished praying, he looked at the couple and he said, okay, you've driven a long distance. Tell me why you've come. And there was silence. And pretty soon the husband kind of muttered something and Bill said, can you say that again? And he said, well... He said, I want you to understand that in the town that I come from, I own a company there. I have about 600 people that are full-time employees at my company. So it was a nice size company. And for the last three decades, I've been the chairman of the board of our church. 
And he said that just two weeks ago, I was arrested in a public park for flashing people. Now they tell you you're not supposed to look shocked in counseling, but I'm sure I look like, <laughs> what in the world is a 75 year old man in a public park in winter flashing people? What? You gotta be kidding me. Maybe I grew up in some small town. And I, th I remember sitting there thinking to myself, hmm. Now, John, you just spent four years in seminary. You ought to be able to help this guy. So what are you going to do? And I thought, for, and I thought, and I thought, and I thought. The only thing I could think of was David dancing naked before God. And that wasn't going to help things at all. I got so desperate, this is no joke, I had my English Bible, I was thumbing to the back of my Bible, the concordance for the word flashing. <laughs> it's not there, just to let you know, it's just not there. And I'm thinking to myself, how would I deal with this? Um, I had no idea. And so I, I started to lean in and listen to what Bill had to say to ask a lot of questions. You got to understand that this particular couple had gone from the peak of respectability in their community and society and overnight, overnight, they had plunged to being rejects in, in their town, society, it drug their company through the mud, drug, drug their family and their name through the mud, it drugged their church through the mud. All of this appeared on the front page of the local papers. The fact that this guy had been flashing people in a public park. And I saw Bill open the scriptures and start dealing with that man's heart and the motivations that would cause that kind of behavior and at the same time, minister hope to that wife who was devastated. And I thought to myself, I need to learn how to do that. I realized at that particular point in seminary, and this is what happens a lot of times in seminaries, you're taught how to dispense the Bible, not minister the Bible. I was taught how to dispense the Bible. I was not taught how to minister the Bible. I could argue all the fine points of Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic. I could argue that all with you, parse all the verbs and the participles. I could do all that stuff, but I did not know how to minister the word of God to people that were really hurting. And at that particular point, I was hooked. I was hooked. I. I said, th thought to myself, I I've got to learn from these guys. These guys have something I don't have. And so I started listening to everything that they were teaching, writing everything down, trying to absorb everything I could at that point. I remember that night driving two and a half hours home, you know, praying, confessing my sin of pride all over the freeway. I got home. My wife was already in bed. At that time, we only had our two daughters, and they were little, and they were already in bed, and my wife was half asleep and I went by the bed and I woke her up a little and she looked at me and, and I said, sweetheart, will you ever forgive me? You have a, a horrible husband. I'm a horrible pastor. I'm a horrible father. And I remember she looked at me, squinted her eyes a little bit and she rubbed them and she says, I don't know what this class is doing, but I like it. <laughs> That's what she said. And at that particular point, I realized I had a lot to learn. I still had a lot to learn about ministry. And that's the genesis of what we want to talk about tonight. Because when you're dealing with counseling issues, you're really dealing with heart issues. If all you do is address behavior, if all you have is a few techniques at addressing 
people's addiction problems. And some of you have been in my earlier seminars, you've heard me say, I don't like the word addiction. It's not a biblical term. You've got to get your counselee to think in biblical terms if they're going to rightly solve their problems. The word addiction is kind of, it's a Latin term. It means an involuntary, involuntary hopelessness. And it's even used that way in the Latin language. But the Bible used a different term. You're not going to find addiction in the Bible. But you will find bondage, enslavement. And when you have bondage and enslavement, there's always the hope to be freed from that bondage. There's always the hope to be freed from that enslavement. You need to get your counseling thinking in those terms. Romans 6 is perfect for that. But how do we deal with heart issues? That's what I want to address this evening. How do we deal with heart issues? This becomes key. So the first thing I want to do is take a look here at the heart itself in terms of the biblical process of change. And the Bible talks a lot about the heart. It's the Bible is replete with references to the metaphorical heart, which is really the core of the soul. And here are several references you can see on the screen. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, Matthew 22, 30, uh, 34 through 40, Proverbs 4, 23, Mark 7, 20 to 23, 1 Samuel 16, 7, Psalm 111 and verse 1, Proverbs 23 and verse 7. All these are references to the heart. But the problem is this. When we read the heart in the Bible, we read a European American meaning into the heart. All right? This is what we call semantic anachronism. That is, we read a late meaning into an ancient word. All right? We read a late meaning into the an, an ancient word. The same thing happens, I think, many times when we read the word soul in the Bible. When we read the word soul, because of the secular culture which we grow out of, and there are even some Christians who accept this too, that we think of a layered consciousness where you have a consciousness, an unconsciousness, a subconsciousness, that is foreign to the Bible. That's reading a late meaning into an ancient word. There's no layered consciousness there in terms of the soul. That, that doesn't exist. There is no such thing in the Bible as a subconscious. That doesn't exist anywhere in the Bible. Not in any, it, it, when it comes to the way the secular mind works in terms of the out of awareness mind, it doesn't it's not there. That's a semantic anachronism. We read late meanings into biblical terms. When it comes to the heart, we do the same thing. When we come to the word heart, we read our modern meanings into the word. And the modern meaning, American European meaning, is basically the heart is the seat of affections. The heart is the seat of feelings. The heart is the seat of romance. That's the idea. We just had Valentine's Day a couple of weeks ago. By the way, gentlemen, if you're late, you better get on this. Two weeks ago. All right. Valentine's Day. And what do you see all in the stores? You see big hearts, big red hearts. You see Cupid shooting arrows through hearts. Why? Because it's associated with romance and love. That is not the biblical understanding of heart. Never was. All right. It's not romance and love. Grab your Bible. Let's go over to Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. Look at this carefully. And this is uniform throughout Scripture. How does the Bible view the word heart? Before the flood, it says, and God saw, and by the way, in the Hebrew here, the word saw is in the imperfect. So in the sense is, and God continually saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now notice that. How is the heart described here? The heart is described as imagining. It's described as thinking. It's really described in the Hebrew here as 
intending. The intentions of a man's heart was only evil continually. The intentions, what he thought, what he expected about life, it was only evil continually. This is such a key thing. While we're still in the Old Testament, go over to Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. Notice how the Old Testament and throughout Scripture, God says the heart directs us. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And then he describes what those are. Verse 24, put away from you a forward mouth um, and perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eye look straight on and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. So the heart directs um, the lips, the mouth, it directs the eyes at what it looks at. It directs the feet in verses 26 and 27. The heart directs all these things, and it comes out of the deep thoughts and intentions and expectations of the heart. That's where it comes from. This is key. Let's go to the New Testament. Let's go to Mark chapter 7. Notice what Jesus says about the heart. Notice how he describes the heart. All right, again, it's not primarily feelings. It's not primarily affections. It's not romance. But in chapter 7, picking up in verse 20, he says, and he said, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Now notice at the top of his list here, out of the heart, the first thing he thinks about are evil thoughts. Out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts. So when we come to what the Bible says about the heart, we're actually dealing with what a person thinks and the way in which they process life, the way that they see life on the inside, whether that perception is right or wrong, we know because of the sinfulness of mankind and its depravity that it is tainted with sin and only the word of God gives clarity to that and helps us to understand how they're perceiving right life wrongly. But now our heart has to do with intentionality, has to do with thoughts, has to do with expectations. What I expect in my heart is, sets my motivations for everything that I want to do. So when counseling, in your dealing with an addict or a person that's really genuinely in bondage or enslaved, to whatever it may be, it can be a chemical, it can be a, a terrible practice where Peter describes uh, the early, early Judaizers as be, training their heart in greed, a heart trained in greed in this particular case. So however that person is trained according to their heart, that's what has to be addressed in counseling. Whatever is going on in terms of their behavior, more than anything else, the heart has got to be addressed. This is really key. And of course, if we were to take a look at this from a biblical perspective, we would say this, that the heart then is the control center of everything that goes on in terms of my life. It is the control center. And it involves our thoughts, <laughs> And, of course, our thinking affects the choices we make, our will. It is informed by our conscience, our motivations, our desires. 
And when the heart of the person is focused primarily on self, then their behavior is always going to be externally, attitudinally, what they do, what they say is going to always produce bad fruit. That's always going to be the case. But when their heart is focused upon Christ, they're going to produce good fruit. Christ honoring fruit. The type of fruit that glorifies the Lord. Go back to Proverbs chapter 20 and we're interested in verse 5. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 5. Notice what Solomon says here in regards to the heart. He says, counsel in the heart of a man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. And the word counsel there in the Hebrew language actually is the word intention. The intentions of a man's heart is like deep water. In other words, you can't see it. It's deeply hidden underneath. It's not talking about a subconscious here. It's talking the fact that we can't see that. This is an area where God sees, but we cannot see. But a man of understanding, this is a man of true wisdom, this is a good counselor in this case, can actually help to draw those issues to the surface. I can't see people's hearts. You can't see people's hearts. But using biblical truth and wisdom, you can draw out the intentions and thoughts of a person's heart how they perceive their life, how they perceive other people, how they perceive what's going on in their environment around them, what is it that's feeding their anxiousness, what's feeding their depression, what is feeding their repetitive behaviors, what is it, how are they perceiving life that comes out of the heart. That's what has to be addressed. And these desires grow up within the heart as Psalm 37 and verse 4 says, Galatians 5, 16 through 26 says, there are desires that grow up in the heart. Sometimes we can have godly desires, but sometimes we can have evil desires and we don't even know that we have evil desires. But nevertheless, they are there. And one of the biggest problems of man is that God says he thinks he knows his heart. That's one of the biggest problems. You and I think we know our heart. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 8. You ever wonder why God took the people of Israel through 40 years of wilderness experience? Well, Deuteronomy 8 tells us. Um, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, God explains why he took Israel through the wilderness experience. Verse 2, he says, And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thy heart. Now, God did not take them. Listen, he did not take them through the wilderness experience so that he could learn what's in their hearts. God's omniscient, he already knew. He took them through the wilderness experience through 40 years of difficulty and suffering so that, listen to me, they would know what's in their hearts. Every single trial, every single difficulty that a person's going through. When I'm working with somebody that's going through chemical withdrawal and all the difficulties and hardships that they go through chemical withdrawal, that's intended by God primarily to teach them their heart and to teach them how much they lack in their trust in him. God takes the people of Israel through the wilderness experience so that they can know what was in their heart, whether they would keep his commandments or not. Verse 3 says, and he humbled them and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna which thou knowest not neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man does not live by bread alone but man lives by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the lord doth man live thy raiment racks not old upon thee neither did thy foot swell these 40 years 
Thou shalt also consider in thy heart that as a man chastises his son, so the Lord thy God chastises thee. Therefore, thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in all his ways and to fear him. Now you understand when he's talking about this, he's talking about the fact that he took them through this experience to not only teach them their heart, but their assumption about their heart was that it was far better off than what it really was. And so as a result of that, he had to humble them in regards to their own heart. Same thing happens to you when you get an argument with your wife, right? I mean, you get really angry at her and all of a sudden you end up saying things that you never thought you'd ever say. Or you get upset with your husband and you end up saying things that you never thought you'd ever say because all of a sudden it's the pressure of that event that brings these things to the surface, right? You go to Detroit, Michigan, to all the car museums up there, you can see they have displays there of um, how they test the pistons on these large trucks and automobiles. And they put the pistons on these large trucks and automobiles in pressure chambers and they turn up the pressure way beyond normal tolerance levels. And you can start seeing in those pistons, little cracks and fissures begin to affirm, uh, show up in those pistons. Why do they do that? Because they want to know exactly how that metal is going to break down. They want to know that God does the same thing to you with your heart. He takes your heart and your counselee's heart. He puts it in the midst of a cauldron of problems turns up the heat, and what comes out of your heart is what your heart truly is. It's what it truly is. That's really key. Sometimes I like to go to restaurants and I order hot tea. Now, I am not fond of all of this orange, organic tea nonsense. Not fond of that at all. And yet a waitress will bring out this great big box of all these different kinds of teas, and I'll tell her how unpatriotic she is because there was only black tea in the Boston Harbor. That's all it was there. There was no green tea, orange tea, or anything else in the Boston Harbor. It was only black tea. That's all I'm looking for is black tea. Now, how do I know whether or not that black tea is any good? You know, I can see who manufactured it. I can sniff it and smell it. I don't know whether it's any good until I put it in hot water, right? God does that with your heart. God takes your heart and puts it into hot water. And it's what comes out, what seeps out. That's what's really in the heart. And you think your heart's better off than what it really is. Your counselee is thinking the same thing. I guarantee you, I've never had a counselee that thought their heart was too terrible. Never had one, ever. I know that there were counselees that kind of said that, but in reality, they didn't believe that. So, what's going on in your heart? What does God do? How does God reveal the situations of the heart? What does God do with those things? He wants to show us. He wants to humble us so that we can confess our sins to him, repent, Straighten out the expectations of our hearts and our thoughts and turn them to worshiping him alone. The location of man's problem is the heart. And God designed the heart in such a way that it worships. It worships. And it can worship all kinds of things. Popularity, peace, play, prestige, power, pleasure, people, protection, physical health, possession. Okay, I'm a pastor. I have to alliterate. It comes with a job. All right. And that's not an exhaustive list. It's just an example. The heart can worship all of those things and more. We end up worshiping the things that are a part of this world. Exodus 20, shall have no other God's before me. No other God's before me. Take your Bible. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 12. There's an example there given on the PowerPoint. In Matthew chapter 12, we're interested in verse 34. 
where it says, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So everything that we say comes out of what's going on, how we're processing life in our heart. This is what is really going on. And we worship these things. We worship these things more than God in our lives. We worship them more than God. So this is where the frustration comes in. Because in this particular case, um, the heart then idolizes these things. This is where demanding desires and lusts take over in the heart and we want certain things. We heard early this morning, Dr. Horn talk about the fact of a person desiring security, desiring significance. These th things can become idols. In our heart, 1 Kings 11, 4, Ezekiel 14, 1 through 14, Romans 1, 25, 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 14. These things become idols in the heart. In fact, let's go over to the 1 Corinthians 1. This is a good one in the New Testament because here the Apostle Paul admonishes the Corinthian church in regards to their own idols and he uses the people of Israel and their wanderings in the wilderness, as we saw back in Deuteronomy chapter 8, as a good example of them. 1 Corinthians 10, he says in verse 2, uh, well, let's begin in, in verse 5. He says, but with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, neither ye be idolaters as were some of them, as, is, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. What is it that they worshiped? They worshiped eating. They worshiped drinking. They worshiped playing, entertainment. Verse 8, neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day th three and twenty thousand neither let us tempt christ as some of them did also tempted and were destroyed of serpents neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer now all these things happen unto them for examples and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come and then in verse 14 he comes back with the admonition wherefore my beloved flee from idolatry whatever they lusted after whatever they craved in their heart that became their idol and people are the same way today they haven't changed we have a new covenant, but people themselves have not changed. They still have idols that are a part of their heart. The Corinthians were struggling with their own idols that were a part of their heart, the same way that the Old Testament Israelites had done that. So how do we determine what's really going on in the heart? How do we determine that? Let's take a look at that. And in fact, what I want to do is highlight significant ways that we can think about identifying idols in our counselee's life. What is it? It is wanting or desiring something that God does not want or desire. Wanting or desire something that God doesn't want or desire. Now, that's pretty clear. I think all of us could identify that pretty quickly. If our counselee wants something that God does not want, then that's wrong. You get a young man or a young lady that comes to you and says, I want to get married and I'm in love with so-and-so, but they're not a Christian, but I believe that God can really change them and pop God possibly could, but that's not good. That's not something that God wants. What fellowship does righteousness have with unrighteousness? This is not good. They're setting themselves up for trouble. They want something deeply in their heart that God doesn't want. That becomes an idol. That person can become an idol or the idol. A marriage can become an idol itself. That's 
Now, marriage in and of itself is a good thing. But they may want to get married so bad that they're willing to marry anybody. It's just something that they want to do. They've always pictured themselves in that kind of a situation. So it's wanting or desiring something that God doesn't want or desire. In addition to this, it could be wanting something that God wants or desires, but wanting it so much that one becomes ungodly to get it or ungodly if they don't get it. It's those parents sitting across the desk from me that are in tears that says, you know, we raised our children in a wonderful Christian home. We made sure that they went to a great church. We made sure that they had a good, godly Christian education. But I've got one child, we've got one child that's walked away from the faith. I just want so badly to see that child come to Christ. Now, wanting to see that child come to Christ is not bad, but you can want it so bad that you become ungodly as a parent, ungodly as a father, ungodly as a mother to get it. Wanting something that God wants or desires, but wanting it so bad that you're willing to be ungodly in order to get it. Or water down your view of salvation in order to get it. I've had wives sit across the desk from me many, many times and say to me, you know, all I want is for my husband to love me. That's all I want. Is that so wrong? No, that's not wrong. Never was wrong. God wants that. The Bible talks about that. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church. But can that become an idolatrous, sinful desire? Absolutely. The point at which wanting my husband to love me becomes more important than being God's kind of woman and wife at that particular point, that it has become an ungodly desire. It's something that I set as an idol in my heart, and I want it more than anything else. How do we know? Because it's the first thing she thinks about when she gets up in the morning. It's the last thing she thinks about before she goes to bed. When she doesn't receive the love from her husband that she thinks that she deserves, then she becomes angry, hateful, mean, vindictive, or maybe she'll swing the other direction, withdraw, become sullen, depressed, non-communicative, Still an idol, whatever reaction, wherever she swings, it's still an idol. Or I have a husband sitting across from me. I've had husbands say this many, many times. All I want is for my wife to respect me. Is that wrong? No, the Bible talks about that. Ephesians 5.33 talks about wives, phobos your husband, reverence your husbands, respect your husbands. Talks about that. So in and of itself, that's a very legitimate desire. Can that become a sinful, idolatrous desire in his life? Absolutely. When? When does that happen? Well, it's the first thing he thinks about when he gets up in the morning, last thing he thinks about before he goes to bed, when he doesn't receive the respect from his wife that he thinks he deserves, he becomes angry, hateful, mean, and vindictive with her. He attacks her verbally or maybe even physically. He may do that. Or maybe he swings the other direction. He doesn't say anything. He doesn't communicate anymore. He's depressed. He's withdrawn. That's just as sinful as the overt expressions of anger. That's wanting something that God wants or desires, but wanting it so much that a person becomes ungodly to get it or ungodly if they don't get it. And our counselees do this all the time, we've got to address the idols that are a part of their heart. We have to address that. Or this, being controlled by expectations and becoming ungodly in thought, word, or deed when expectations are not realized. Wow. Expectations are seedbeds of idols. Expectations are seedbeds of idols. What we expect in our life, what we expect... In terms, some of you are students can re understand this. I expect to get a certain grade on this paper. And it seems like your professor is an obstacle to that. All right? I expect, and when I don't get the grade that I really expect, then I become upset. Or I'm depressed. Or I want to give up. Being controlled by expectations expectations you have about life, 
about other people, expectations that you have at church, in your friendships, interpersonal communication expectations that are not met and we become angry, upset, or withdrawn and depressed, that's when those expectations that are part of our heart have become idols that rule us. They dominate our life. People with, that are enslaved to chemical abuse have all kinds of expectations. Some of them take that chemical, whatever form it may come in, in order to escape from life. Others take it as, as an anesthetic away from life. So I don't have to feel the hurt and the difficulties of life. These now become expectations. I have to have this in order to deal with life. In fact, I have to take it on a regular basis, and that's what normal life is. Life is not normal when I do not have it. Then a person's enslaved. They're enslaved to it. Or this, perceiving a deserved right and following through with ungodly thoughts, words, and actions to get it when that right is denied. Now, Americans, we're big on rights, aren't we? <laughs> oh, we, so are. we even have a Bill of Rights. Did you know that? We have a Bill of Rights. We love rights. Perceiving a deserved right and then following through with ungodly thoughts, words, and actions in order to get it when that right is denied. I have a right to be understood. <laughs> People will think that. I have a right for that person to really like me. I have a right to raise well-behaved children. <laughs> Where'd you get that right? All right. I have a right to have a pastor that wows me on Sunday morning. I mean, I want him to put me on the ground in awe. I have a right to have that. Where'd you get that right from? Where did you get that from? Perceiving a deserved right and then following through with ungodly thoughts and words and actions in order to get that right when it's denied. You know at that particular point that that right now has become an idol. I have the right to have a beautiful wife or a handsome husband. And if I don't have one, then I'm going to go get another one. I have that right. Where'd you get that right from? You know, you carefully study the Bible. I'm being very sincere about this. If I understand the scriptures rightly, the only right that you and I really have is to burn in hell. That's the only right that we have. But by the grace of God, hey? But by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and because of his grace, we don't. So that means every morning you get up, you ought to be able to say, whoa, look, I'm not in hell. I have a roof over my head. I get to serve the Lord today. Look, I am blessed beyond measure. What rights do I have, really? Never forget, back a couple years ago, I love doing this on a regular basis. I go up to Berkeley, California. There's a student group up there that invites me up, and um, they ask me to do presentations there at Berkeley, and so I'll do a presentation at Berkeley, and invariably they'll ask questions. They love the Q&A sessions, and I'll get this question on a regular basis. How can you believe that there is a God when there are so many disasters in this world going on? I mean, there are tsunamis and there's earthquakes and people are dying. How can you believe that there is a God? And I say to them, that confirms to me that there is a God. And they're, they're like, huh, what? Because in asking that question of me, they assume that you and I have a right to live. So they're focusing on all the people that died, and it's certainly terrible tragedies. I'm not minimizing that at all. Terrible tragedies. 
But I'm looking at all the people that are still alive and saying, why? Why are we still alive? Because God could eliminate all of us on this planet and not for a nanosecond would he cease to be unrighteous, right? He could take care of all of us. We don't have a right to live. Where did we get that right from? We don't have that right. It's only by the gracious work of God that that comes by. Where do these rights come from? Your counselees will have idols in their heart that come out of these deserved rights that they think that they must have. How about believing in something, a standard or a rule that is not of God that leads to ungodly practices? We set up artificial standards in our life. And if you're not practicing the Christian life exactly the way I practice the Christian life, then you must not be a Christian. Really. Artificial standards. Where do those standards come from? They're not coming from the Bible. They're coming from what I'm used to practicing. That's what they're coming from. They're coming from what I'm used to practicing. And because it's normal for me to practice those things, then I'm going to generalize all of those as norms for everybody else. And if you're not practicing your Christianity exactly the way that I practice my Christianity, then there's got to be something wrong with you. Then what you've done is you've elevated those particular standards or rules that are not of God, they're your, just your selective standard or rules to an idolatrous level. And you're expecting everybody else to live according to those standards or rule. You want to start a real big fight. It's not a big deal anymore, but if you want to start a good fight in a church, go to youth group and talk about dating, courting, or betrothal. All right? You want to start a war, just do that, because the parents on various sides will bring out their theological guns and aiming at each other. I'm of the dating crowd. I'm of the courting crowd. I'm of the betrothal crowd. And they all claim biblical authority for all of what the way, what they do. And they elevate their particular practices to an idolatrous level. And they expect everybody else to bow down to their particular practices. So believing in something, a standard or a rule that's not of God that leads to ungodly practices. Or having a mindset that is against the truth of God's word that leads to ungodly ungodliness in thoughts, words, and actions. Sometimes we adopt mindsets that become idolatrous, and they usually involve certain assumptions about people and circumstances, and they become idolatrous. I expect my life to always be comfortable. It's a mindset that I accept, and I'm not going to accept anything different from that, and I'll do anything I can, even ungodly things, in order to make my life comfortable. There are so many ways in which that can be shown as being ungodly. You understand at this particular point that whatever your heart says, I must have or not have, is what you worship. Whatever your counselee's heart says, that it must have or not have, I must not have this, I must have this, becomes their ruling desires. They become the counselee's functional gods, the controlling inner cravings that are a part of those, those idolatrous desires. That's what we're after. Real change when it comes to enslavement, chemical enslavement, or some kind of behavioral enslavement to sin, real change is not merely changing the behavior or the practice. You understand that? Bill Good, I told you a little bit about him early on. He told me a story several years ago. God has since promoted Bill to heaven, but he told me a story. He was counseling a woman and her 19-year-old son, and already at the age of 19, this son was a heavy drinker. And the mother brought the son in for counseling, and Bill started to work with him. And about two sessions into the counseling, the mother decided, oh, no, I don't want to do this. I, 
I'm going to pull him out and put him into a 12-step program. And so Bill said to me, he said, I watched that young man get pulled out of biblical counseling, put in a 12-step program. Here I was working with him. I actually was starting to make some really substantive progress with the guy. He said that that young man went into that 12-step program a lying, hateful, wicked, God-dishonoring drunk. And he came out the other end a lying, hateful, wicked, God-dishonoring, sober guy. So what had happened? Well, they had gotten him off of the alcohol, but was his soul in any better condition? No, it was not. His soul was not in any better condition. What I worship, my functional gods. That mother, I know she intended well towards her son, but she thought as long as I could get my son off of alcohol, everything's great. No, 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 no. As biblical counselors, you've got to be much more holistic. We don't want to get people out of their drugs. That's not our goal. Our goal is to teach them to be Christ-like, and the main tool is the gospel of grace. That is the main tool, the gospel of grace. So what about the passions of the heart? What is your counselee really passionate about? Whatever that is, is probably their idol. You're going to have to help them address that heart issue. 